It was the 17th of December 1987. He was told you will be lucky to see Christmas. His name was Paul Heyman. He was just 19 years old. He was a desperate man. I don't know if you feel desperate at the moment. Many do. Uh, some feel desperately lonely, isolated, cut off, uh, wondering when all this Covid will be over and life can get back to normal. Others are desperately anxious, anxious about the children going back to school or perhaps not, uh, anxious about work. What will happen to me? Will there be a job there when things get back more to normal? How will I pay the bills? Uh, some people feel desperately frustrated. Why are we having all these rules? Why can't we just get on with things? Uh, why doesn't the government do something? Some people are feeling desperately poorly, maybe self-isolating at home, wondering if they have COVID-19. Others are desperately sick in hospital, receiving life-saving treatment. Uh, desperation is a common human experience. Whether you describe yourself as that desperate or not, many of us know those feelings, anger, fear, frustration, anxiety. We look to someone to help. This passage that we're looking at today asks us the question, who do you look to when you feel desperate? So let's turn to the passage and see how it opens up when we meet a desperate man and who he looked to. So here in the first few verses, we meet a desperate man. The text shows us that, doesn't it? He's not a walking wounded. He's not walking with the aid of a stick. He's not in a wheelchair. He is so needy that four of his friends have to carry him. He's a dead weight. Uh, they're desperate. Uh, they come towards Jesus and they see crowds of people listening to Jesus and they think, we're never going to get our friend to Jesus. So they take him up a flight of stairs. That would have been a challenge, wouldn't it? And then on the flat roof, they decide the only way in their desperation to get him to Jesus is to dig a hole and let him down. Uh, we're not talking a tiled steep roof here. We're talking a Middle Eastern home, uh, but they would have still had to make a lot of mess. Uh, and the crowd would have looked up and think, what on earth is happening? They were desperate and they were looking to Jesus for help with their friend. Uh, they felt if we don't get him to Jesus, what's going to happen to him? We're not going to go home today unless we get to Jesus. Their thought was that Jesus might be able to help them. Jesus had got a reputation for helping people, perhaps healing people. We're going to get our friend to Jesus, come what may. That's how our text opens up to us. But then the next thing it opens up to us is this. What do you think Jesus can do for you? What do you think Jesus can do for you? Now, what would you expect Jesus would do for the man? He comes down through this huge hole in the roof and the crowd is sort of gasping, what on earth is going on? Now, what would you expect next? Well, I think one of two things. Jesus could either say, I'm sorry, I'm just a preacher. That's what I would say uh, if you made a big hole and come down through the roof to me. All I could say was, I'm sorry, I'm just a preacher. I'm teaching the Bible. I can't heal you. Or if Jesus could heal, you'd expect seeing this desperate man, seeing the desperate measures these people had taken, that Jesus would say, be healed. But he doesn't. Then comes this unexpected section. Notice what he says. Son, what a lovely term of endearment that is. Son, your sins are forgiven. Your track record with God is wiped away. You're now back in a good relationship with God. Quite a remarkable thing. Jesus forgives the man his sins. Now, 
To us today, that's kind of unusual language. But we do know something about having a track record. Uh, I don't know if you're a driver, but if you are, you will have a license. And you can get points on your license if you don't drive properly. So, for example, there is DR70, failing to provide a specimen for a breath test. You can get four points on your license for up to four years. Can I tell you this? Jenny nearly got that. Uh, I was poorly and it was uh, New Year's Eve a few years ago. And I said, well, why don't you go to some friends who'd asked you out in Rushton? And on the way back, blue lights, stop Jenny. Uh, and wanted a breathalyzer. Now, thankfully, she had had no problem with drinking. She hadn't done that. But uh, she couldn't puff very hard. And they said to her, I'm sorry, madam, if you fail to provide a breath test sample, we will have to take you the cells for the night. Well, thankfully, Jenny huffed and puffed with all her might and did uh, provide the sample and came home pretty red cheeked and told me the story. That's DR70. Some of you may know of SP10. Uh, that's the one where uh, uh, you exceed the statutory speed limit on a public road. And uh, you can get uh, between three and six points uh, on your license for up to four years. And then there's DR20. Uh, that's driving or attempting to drive with alcohol consumption above the legal limit. You can get three to 11 points, and that will be on your license for 11 years. Uh, some of you may know that if you get 12 or more points, you can get a driving ban. And if you're a new driver uh, and you've not been driving yet for two years, you can get uh, banned or having to go back and do all your tests for just having six points on your license. But there comes a time when those points are wiped away. You've got no more record. What a sigh of relief if you had points on your license. This man, as all of us, have a record with God. And it's a serious record of things that we have thought and felt and said and done and not done that keep, keep creating a huge barrier between us and God. And Jesus wipes it all away in one go. A remarkable example of Jesus' mercy. But here's the question. Why did he do that first? Why didn't he just heal the man? There was an obvious desperate need to be healed. Why did Jesus forgive him his sins first? Well, it's that word triage. Have you ever been triaged? I have been a few times. I broke uh, my left foot playing sport one Saturday afternoon, I went to the A&E department. I was triaged, basically said, uh, well, please go and wait over there. It's somewhat of a self-inflicted injury. I was in quite a bit of pain. I'd broken my foot in two places. Three and a half hours later, I went in and thankfully, in the kindness of the NHS system, I was looked after. On another occasion, I didn't feel too poorly and I didn't feel in that much pain, but I did have some chest pains. I went into A&E. They told me, do not move. Within two minutes, I'd been ushered in. I was linked up to an ECG. I was triaged. It was potentially a very serious problem. Basically, what A&E do is try and sort out the most important life-threatening things and deal with those first. Although my foot was hurting, it was not a life-threatening problem. I was triaged. Well, Jesus is showing us what the most important thing he can do for us is. He can come to deal with our problem of our soul, our relationship with God. He's come to save our souls, the old SOS. He's come to do that first. For Jesus, that's the most important, significant thing he can ever do for you. What would you come to Jesus for? Well, I guess there's lots of things. But this man shows us we can come to Jesus for our most desperate need to be met. The wiping away 
of all the wrong thoughts and deeds and words we've ever done so that we have a new relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. Then that poses the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? You'll see that the text, the story, spends a lot of time, not so much on the miracle Jesus did or the words that Jesus said, but the thinking of people around him. There were some religious pros present, some teachers of the law. Uh, these are the people who are like very religious, very well genned up, know their Bible back to front. And they are thinking to themselves, who's this fellow? Who can heal sins but God alone? He's blaspheming. They assume that Jesus is a mere mortal and that he's just done something very wrong. In our culture, blasphemy doesn't seem to mean an awful lot, but in their culture, it's a serious, perhaps the most serious evil a human being can do. They see Jesus as someone who has done something terribly wrong in claiming to be able to forgive this man's sins. Their thinking is like this. Premise A, only God can forgive sins. Premise B, he's only a man. In fact, they call him this fellow. And thirdly, therefore, if he's only a mere man and he's claiming to do only what God can do, he must be blaspheming, impersonating God. That's their reasoning. Now, Jesus deconstructs that. Notice how the text gives us that little hint. There's a lot more going on with Jesus than meets the eye. Knowing what they're thinking in detail, knowing what they're thinking. Uh, some of you may remember that Mel Gibson film, What Women Want, where he could overhear the thoughts of people he was passing by. It's a scary thought, isn't it, that someone can read our thoughts. But Jesus could. There's a hint in the text that Jesus is not just a mere man. But then it moves on and Jesus brings them to this puzzle. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or be healed. Well, of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. You can't check that out. If you say be healed, well, you'll soon be shown up to be a fraud or not. And they uh, know that. So Jesus said, well, let me show you. I will do what you can check out so that you know I have the authority and the power and the right to do what you can't check out. I will do before your very eyes a miracle that only God can do so that you know that when I forgave his sins, I was also doing something that only God can do. So Jesus turns to the man, tells him to get up and take his mat and walk out. And at a word, immediately the man does. And the crowd are struck. They've never seen anything like this. And of course, they haven't. And nor have we. For Jesus is claiming to be God on earth, doing what only God can do. He has just done a, an astonishing miracle in front of their very eyes. And they should have reasoned, premise A, only God can forgive sins. That's true. Premise B, we're wrong. He's not just a mere fellow. He is God-man. And premise C, he's not blaspheming at all. He's speaking the truth. That's how they should have thought. But then notice something very sad. Given all that, what would you expect next? Well, you'd think that they'd queue up and say, well, if you can forgive that man's track record, will you forgive mine? Uh, clearly, all of us know we've done and thought and said things wrong. All of us know that we're not in a right relationship with God. Naturally, you would have thought that the queue would have been around the block waiting for Jesus to forgive. You would have thought they would have reasoned, well, if he can forgive this fellow who's come down through the roof, perhaps he can do that for me too. I'll go to Jesus to have that need met. But the sad thing is, there is no cue. The crowd are a bit dumbstruck 
and these religious professionals go away and we're going to find in sections to come they plot to take Jesus life they see him as an enemy not as a friend and you know what I found the same sad things happening when this story has been told many many times since it comes up in our explore course it's an online course that we'll be doing again soon and uh, you can access if you'd like and one of the sections looks at this story and gets people to talk it through and understand what Jesus is saying and doing I wonder what you think Jesus is saying and doing here sadly I've heard people come out with all kinds of things that avoid the implications of what Jesus has just said and done I've heard this uh, well it was all staged a bit like that Steve Martin film, The Leap of Faith. It's faked. The men, the, the sick guy, uh, all there to make Jesus look good. I've, I've heard that. I've heard others say, well, uh, yeah, I, it's very helpful, but I don't think I've got anything really bad that Jesus needs to forgive. I, I don't really see that I need my sins forgiven. I've heard others say, well, it's all very well, this forgiving your sins and saving your soul, but... What about my problems at work or what about my problems in relationships or what about my problems with my bank balance? The other kinds of needs crowd out the most desperate need. And then others will say something like this. Well, I'm glad you believe in this. I'm glad it's sincere. You're sincere about this. But no, it's not really for me. Again, kind of deflecting away from what Jesus has just said and done. Now, what about you? Do you see that Jesus can meet your most desperate need? Would you go to him for yourself and ask him to forgive your track record, to clear it all away so that you can enter into a new relationship with God and know him as a heavenly father and Jesus as your Lord and Saviour and you'd follow him? That's what many have done over the years. That's what many have experienced, the marvel of being forgiven. Let me take you back to Paul Heyman, the person who told him those words that he might not see Christmas. That was said by Professor Sir Terence English, the renowned heart transplant surgeon. In that following week, a donor heart became available and uh, Paul received a heart transplant and has become the longest living heart transplant uh, recipient in our nation. And this is what he said just a few years ago. Receiving the heart was the greatest gift anyone in the world will receive. It's a miracle. Each day I think I'm here. I have to pinch myself each day. I can't comprehend that I'm still here. Paul is profoundly grateful that someone else who lost their life gave him a chance to live. How much more those of us who are Christians, who know that our past record has been wiped away, can live each day in the light of that? We sometimes sing a song, it's a little bit old fashioned now, a bit old school, but it goes like this, my sins, oh the bliss of this wondrous thought, my sins, not in part but in whole, have been nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, praise the Lord. That's the response of joyful gratitude. Earlier on, you remember how Jesus said, which is it easier to say? Well, if he truly is the Son of God, it was easier to say, be healed. That was an exercise of his power. But for Jesus to say, son, your sins are forgiven, is going to involve Jesus in the greatest of self-sacrificing gifts. He would love us enough to die for our sins on the cross, to take the blame. We have received the greatest gift of a new start with God, all at the cost of Jesus on the cross. We should live each and every day in the light of that with a joy and a peace and a hope and a love. We sometimes will feel desperate, but our deepest, most desperate need has been met by Jesus. 
What a joy and a privilege to be a follower of him. Let this passage encourage you to live each and every day as someone who has, as it were, been raised up and living life to the full for Jesus. May God encourage you to do that.